listening I'll tell you the truth about God Well, with that, would you open your Bibles to Isaiah 51? Isaiah 51. I think we could go around the room and quite easily uh, listen to report after report of people who have said, this verse, this chapter changed my life. It impacted me greatly, gave me insight, brought me healing, brought me to a place of enlightenment concerning the will of God. And I will say tonight, this chapter literally changed my life. I'm not just speaking hyperbole. It changed my life. It changed where I live. It changed what I did. And I have to say, our chapter is why I'm here tonight. And the fact is, God certainly could have raised up anybody to be the pastor of this church and to plant this church. And I will readily admit that there are some who are better suited to the task. But in the middle of the night, in the early hours of a Tuesday morning in 1997, God woke me with two words that reverberated in my mind, and those words were Isaiah 51. I wasn't quite sure exactly what to do with that and read it through uh, in the morning, and um, I, I don't think it would have helped me any to read it at 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, but um, uh, I read it, and it is the two words that literally caused us to leave our church home of 11 years and move back to Orange County, where we were from. Now, in that time, we had, over the years, a few times tried to sell our home uh, that we had purchased and lived in for 11 years, and our home would never sell until I heard those two words, Isaiah 51. And once I heard those two words and they came along, we moved and we weren't told where to go either, which is kind of interesting in light of our opening two verses. Now, I know that many of us have life verses or life chapters, and I have two chapters. I mentioned that, I think, last Wednesday night, Isaiah 51 and 1 Peter 4. And really, 1 Peter 4 is the chapter that, that defines my life as one who no longer does the will of the Gentiles and drunkenness and all the other things listed there. And Isaiah 51, I will say, is the chapter that describes my life, at least ever since 1997. Now, I believe that Isaiah 51 is going to become your life chapter tonight, too. And I'll tell you why as we go. First of all, in Isaiah 1.9, the Lord said through Isaiah, unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. And in case you're wondering, that would be bad. That would be definitely a negative thing that they would have experienced unless the Lord of hosts had left them a small remnant. Now, we've mentioned in recent weeks and chapters that the Lord is speaking forward through Isaiah into the time where the nation of Israel would be overthrown by Nebuchadnezzar and his armies and carried away captive to the city of Babylon. At this point in time, Jerusalem is destroyed, at least prophetically in our chapter. The temple had been plundered and the people displaced. Now, in our past few chapters, God has been speaking to the nation collectively. But what we're going to note tonight is he zeroes in on a small remnant a very distinct group among the nation as a whole, and he identifies them as those who follow righteousness and seek the Lord. We'll find those phrases in our opening verses. Now, I have to say, I don't recall a time where you guys know how much I like titles. I changed the title to this message at least 25 times yesterday here in the sanctuary and just couldn't land on anything. And then finally, there was only one thing that made sense, and it's a feature of the group that's addressed here in Isaiah. And they have among them a common identifier, I do believe also with those of our day, who are going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, indeed, I think we can well title our time and our topic tonight, and it's just a two-word title. And I was hoping to have a little sound bite to go with it, you know, like a bum 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 kind of thing, but <laughs> wasn't able to work that out. But our title tonight is The Listeners. The Listeners, the group the Lord is going to talk about, 
I think we could well dub as the listeners, and they are present in our day as well. Now, uh, it's not some creepy Stephen King kind of listener, you know, like the Watchers or Children of the Corn or some weirdo thing. And it's not a CIA Big Brother thing either, though we have a lot of that going on in our day as well. But rather, I want to talk about the listeners in this sort of way. Revelation 2, 7 says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God, obviously a heavenly promise. And what a beautiful promise it is to those who are willing to hear. Now, not all are willing to hear, right? Inside the church and certainly not outside. And we know this is true in the history of the nation of Israel as well. As 2 Kings 17, 13 to 14 says, Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all his prophets, every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Nevertheless, they would what? They would not hear. They were not listeners. And, uh, but stiffen their necks, remember that's code for stubborn, like the necks of their fathers who did not believe in the Lord their God. What an indictment that is. They wouldn't hear because they didn't believe. Now, this contrast within the people of God, the national people group, known as God's chosen people, the Jews, the nation of Israel, and uh, Jacob and other names associated with them, this contrast within that group ought to remind us of something we talked about on Sunday in the Sermon on the Mount, and that is not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven because some are stiff-necked and do not believe the Lord, yet call themselves as a part of the church. Now, the group who will not enter into the kingdom of heaven are not unlike the group that is addressed here through Isaiah by inspiration of the Spirit. We can well describe them as those living in Babylon who are not of Babylon. And we too are living in this world, but we are not to be of this world. Hence Paul's exhortation in 2 Corinthians to come out from among them and be what? Separate, says the Lord. Don't touch the unclean things. Now, three times in our verses, the Lord is going to say to this very small remnant, listen to me. Now, I found this to be rather curious as I began to study this past week for this particular chapter. Isn't it interesting that the one who has all the answers has to ask people to listen to him? Why don't we just go to him and say, Abba, I need help, I need wisdom, I need direction. But the Lord has to exhort even the remnant, listen to me. Now, we know that not everybody listens, as we said, but there are those who are righteous, even in our day, and I think many of them are sitting here this evening. Hallelujah. You love Jesus, right? You want to listen to the word of God? Amen? Amen. Now, I believe that there are those who seek the Lord, who are willing to hear what the Spirit says, even though they are far, uh, few and far between in times such as these. Now, I say I believe this chapter will become your life chapter tonight as well, because we are living at a time where our nation is turning from God and our nation is either becoming or already is Babylon. And it, will be, it would be as Sodom and Gomorrah if not for the very small remnant of listeners. And friends, listen. Someday, since God has not appointed us to wrath, he's going to get all the listeners out of the way. And then he's going to deal with this earth in rather dramatic fashion. And we can be sure that his hand is stayed even on our country because we're here, because that's how God operates. Now, however, as we mentioned each week, there is a great escape that's a coming. And I believe it's soon. So tune in because God is speaking to a group who watched their country be destroyed. Yet they kept their faith and continued steadfast even when others who bore the same identity with them, Israel for them, the church for us, turned their back on the word of God. Listen, God is faithful to the listeners. We want to be one. Amen? 
big chapter, much to say, uh, rather handy division, easily recognized in this chapter, beginning with verses one through eight, and we'll look at the second half next time we're together. But would you stand and read with me tonight our text in this magnificent life chapter, Isaiah 51, verses one through eight. Read with me, please. Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Listen to me, my people, and give ear to me, O my nation. For law will proceed from me, and I will make my justice rest as a light of the peoples. My righteousness is near. My salvation has gone forth, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands will wait upon me, and on my arm they will trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look on the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish away like smoke, the earth will grow old like a garment, and those who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will not be abolished. I think we ought to pause and say hallelujah right there, man. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, you people in whose heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults. For the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Now, I have to say, and not to bore you with too much of my own testimony, so to speak, but there had been a stirring in my heart for some time at our former church that God was calling us to move on. But when you're experiencing such wonderful fellowship and being used in ministry, who wants to walk away from that? And indeed, the Lord was stirring in our hearts, and it was verses one and two that told us it was time for us to move on. It was a calling that was not unlike Abraham's. And this is what the Lord spoke to me. Look to Abraham in detail as to how he was called. And looking back on his story, Genesis 12, 1 says, The Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Now, for us on the practical level, it was kind of interesting because we sold our house, and three weeks before escrow closed, we had no idea where we were going to move. We had no idea where God wanted us to go. And much like Abraham, he said, Get out or go, and then I'll show you as you do. We were packing, having garage sales, getting ready to move, even though the land had yet to be shown to us. Now, for me, on a personal level, this one portion where the Lord said, look to Abraham, your father. Remember, Abraham is the father of all who believe, not simply the Jewish nation. And we are indeed in father. Remember, there's no uh, Hebrew word for ancestor, grandfather, so the term is uh, ancestor in its meaning. And I wondered what, looked to Abraham, I called him alone and blessed him, meant. And that really troubled me for a while, but come to find out as things evolved and as we moved away and found a home and moved back to Orange County, what the Lord was calling me to do was not be part of an existing church, but to plant a church. And it happens to be this one, and I'm so glad he called me to that. It's blessed to be here. I'm blessed to be here with you tonight. Now, I share all these things with you for this reason, because all of these life events began through one thing, listening. Listening to a voice, a still small voice in the middle of the night that just whispered two words, really a chapter I didn't know too much, if anything, about at the time, but I know it quite well uh, this evening. 
Now, God here is speaking to the remnant in Babylon who were following after righteousness and seeking the Lord. And he was telling them, don't lose heart in the face of impossible odds. It doesn't look like anything can happen. It doesn't look like there's any possibility. But look how I deal with those kind of situations by looking back to how this nation began. Look back to Abraham, your father. Look back to Sarah, your mother. He says, metaphorically speaking of the rock, using a term familiar with quarrying stone, and they were basically cut from the same cloth is what the Lord means as he explains the metaphor in verse 2. Now he says, listen to me. Look back to Abraham and Sarah, almost as if saying, talk about impossibility. Talk about something that was going to require my hand. And he's drawing their minds not just back to Abraham and Sarah or Abram and Sarai, but all that had happened since. The numerous decisions, descendants, didn't God promise that their descendants would be like the stars of the heavens and the sand of the sea? And this was from this older couple. And there was promised to be a nation that would come from them and a promised Messiah who would come from that nation and comfort Zion. And then the Lord pulls their minds forward and says, because of my ability to do the impossible in the past, know that an Eden-like condition can be restored to your wasteland that is now your life, including joy and gladness and songs of thanksgiving. Have you ever been in one of those situations in life where maybe you just didn't know if you could ever sing again or Give praise again, at least not in the heartfelt sense. You ever wondered if maybe you were going to move out of lip service to God back into heartfelt praise and a sincere joy of the soul that has to be expressed through the lips? Well, that's exactly what the remnant was going through. The listeners needed to hear what the Lord was saying because we also need to hear this tonight who live in a homeland that is quickly becoming a wasteland. Now, I want to use our title tonight to introduce the three life lessons from the three listen to me sections of our text. And the first is this. Listen, this is, I'm sorry, it's really simple and it's nothing new, but it is being abandoned with great rapidity in our day and it's picking up steam, if you will. But brothers and sisters, here's who God is talking to in a nation that's been destroyed because of idolatry. He identifies this group as the remnant, as we mentioned, but here's one of the attributes of them. Now listen, or two of them, I should say. The listeners believe and live according to God's word. The listeners believe and live according to God's word. Now, as I said, that's a no-brainer. We understand that, but listen, it is easy to say we believe God, but it's a different matter to live it out loud in a time such as this. It is a different matter to live according to the word of God in a visible fashion where people can see what you believe by everything you do, how you conduct yourselves, and certainly the words that you say. And Paul talking about just such a city was dealing with the issue, I love how Ray Stedman calls first and second Californians. We know them as Corinthians. But he says in 1 Corinthians 16, 13 to 14, watch, pay attention. Stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong, let all that you do be done with love. Now, isn't that kind of an interesting mingling of terms? Be brave, be strong, and then it's tempered with let all that you do be done with love. That's what God is saying to the remnant in Babylon. That's what God is saying to the remnant in America. That's what God is saying to CCT this Wednesday night, I do believe. He is saying to you and to me, Believe and live according to the word of God and do so standing fast, being brave and strong with the strength that he supplies and do it all in his love. Well, today was a tough day, wasn't it? Today was a really bizarre day, I think, for all of us as our Supreme Court, rather interestingly, made it quite clear that our government has no problem overriding the will of the American people. And indeed, it is an interesting development. There's many things we could talk about today. But I have to say, two things really struck out at me today in the midst of the dialogue that was being carried on through the various mediums. Well, the first was this. 
there are many alleged Christians who don't believe the Bible. There's a lot of alleged Christians, and I say that without apology, who don't believe the Bible. Listen, you can't separate the Word of God and the God of the Word. They're a package deal. Now, I do want to say this. Here's the second thing I observed today. There are many alleged Christians who don't know how to show the love that's taught in the Bible. There's a lot of Christians who don't know how to show the love that is taught in the Bible, especially love for their enemies. Didn't Jesus say, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you? Was that just a suggestion or was that instruction? So therefore, what are we to do? We are to love our enemies and do good to those who hate us and pray for those who spitefully use us is how Jesus gives our instruction in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, listen, friends, this is a tough thing to be sure, but the Lord wants us to hold fast to his word in times such as these. Even as we see the digression, I I have to say, this has happened so many times here and it just, you know, I'm getting more and more convinced that God knows what he's doing. I think it was, it is so crazy, the providence of God, that after spending however many, when did we start the Gospel of Mark? Was that September 2011 or something like that? That we wind up on the verses we wound up in last Sunday and then this happens today. Who could do that? I'm so, I'd like to say I'm smart enough to figure that out, but I, I are not. God did that. He landed us right where we needed to be in Scripture, and I think we're there again tonight. I think he's reminding us that we indeed are to be faithful to him and just basic truth. I mean, think about it. Uh, Every year when the sports rolls around, baseball and football and basketball, these guys that are making way too much money for putting a ball through a hole or being able to catch it or all those things, that's a lot of money for being athletically inclined. But what do they do every year? When they go back to spring training or mini camp for football, what do they work on? Trick plays? No, they work on the fundamentals, the basics. That's why, friends, we need to understand that this foundation of believing and living according to the word of God might be simplistic, but the fact that it's not happening has a lot to do with why our nation is in the condition that it's in. Now, you and I need to remember also a great promise from Deuteronomy 7, 9, where the Lord says through Moses, therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God. I like that right there. Know that the Lord your God, he is God. He's the only one. The faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and do whatever they please. No, what? Those who love him and keep, guard from loss or injury, keep his commandments. We are to adhere to the word of God, including how God has defined marriage. And we are to do so in love. Amen? Now, I want you to consider something. This Deuteronomy 7, 9 thing, that's pretty good information. But information only becomes valuable when you do what? When you apply it. When it transforms your life. When you live by it. Shouldn't knowing that God keeps his covenant and mercy for a thousand generations. That's a Hebraism, by the way, for forever. Shouldn't that change how we live, even though there's just a few of us? I'd say that was something handy for the Babylonian captives. I think it's something handy for you and I as Christians today, even when we feel as though we're captives in a strange land. Now listen, the listeners are not deterred from believing and living according to the word of God, even when their own country has gone down the tubes and is now a captive in Babylon. God says to Israel and to you and I, listen, I birthed a nation From a 90-year-old woman and a 100-year-old man, I got this covered. I can take care of this. Now, God moves in mysterious ways. Amen? Amen. Now, Now, listen, if it were me, I would have thought that if he's going to birth a nation from a 90 year old woman and a 100-year-old man, she should have had quintuplets or something, right? (laughs) But how many children did they have, Abraham and Sarah? They had one. Now, sometimes change comes slowly, but God is always on the move. He always is watching out for us. Friends, listen, just hold fast what you have till he comes. And God is saying to the church today, live by my word. I got this handled. 
Look at verses four through six once again. What's the opening phrase? Listen to me. Interesting subtlety here. My people, and give ear to me, O my nation. For law will proceed from me, and I will make my justice rest as a light of the peoples. My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands, meaning continents, will wait upon me, and on my arm they will trust. Speaking of the right arm, his strength. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look on the earth beneath, for the heavens will vanish away like smoke. The earth will grow old like a garment. And those who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will not be abolished. Now, we've been told once to listen to me. Verse 7, we'll hear it again. But the subtlety I mentioned is in our verse where in verse 1 and in verse 7, the word listen is sama and it means to hear intelligently. Obviously, we would understand it as to comprehend. God is saying, get this in your mind, understand this. Now, the word in verse 4 is the word kasab, which does not mean to hear intelligently, but it rather means to perk up the ears. We might understand that as to listen close, tune in. This is the important part of the hub of the three listen to me's. Now, we could understand it through Hebrews 2, 1, where we're told, therefore, we must give the more what? The earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Now, give more earnest heed to what's about to be said is a great way to understand our middle verses, or don't miss this, perk up your ears. And then he says, my law will proceed, and that word proceed is the Hebrew yasa, and it means to bring out. Justice is the word that's used for judicial sentencing. Now, he talks about his rest there, but interestingly, the word rest actually means to toss suddenly and violently. And light obviously speaks of illumination or enlightenment to the people. Now, he also mentions here that his righteousness is near. Now, that word near is rather interesting there in verse five because the word near actually means next of kin. God says, my righteousness is my next of kin. Now, put all this together in this obviously prophetic section here, yet there is some practical application. If we simply ask this question, who suffered violently and claimed to be the light of the world and satisfied man's death sentence by, doing, by stretching out his arms who was kin to God? Now, that's pretty much a no-brainer, right? Obviously, this is messianic, God's son. Now, we're also told to lift up our eyes to the heavens. And I think the psalmist captured the idea quite well in Psalm 121, where he writes, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. He answers his own question. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. I'm glad God never dozes off. Amen. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve you going out and you coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. I want you to think about this. I think we can relate to it probably a bit more handily in recent months and years than maybe we could have a decade ago or so. Can you imagine the mind games the devil was playing on the Israelites in captivity? Can you think of how much he was trying to get in their head? The Jews who were captive in Babylon, who saw the city in which the Lord had promised that his name would be there perpetually. And he even said in the temple, I will hear prayers made in this place some 400 years earlier at the dedication of the temple. Now, what do you think the devil was saying? 
having now seen their city destroyed by a pagan army, seeing unbelievers rule the country and roll right over the things that they had treasured, treasured at least the remnant. The devil, I'm sure, was saying things like this. Where's your God now? You didn't worship idols, Mr. or Ms. Listener. Why did he let this happen to you? What are you doing here in Babylon when you didn't do anything wrong? You were the one who stood steadfast for the word of God. And here you are, carried away. And you know he was talking like this to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because the Bible tells us Nebuchadnezzar carried away the best and the brightest of Israel to serve in his temple. Well, the best and the brightest, I submit to you, are the listeners. Those who believe and live according to the word of God. That includes you. Come on, you can own that. You're smart enough to be in church tonight, right? No better place to be. Now, listen. Here's a takeaway in summary form of the Lord's exhortation to Israel in captivity. Listen, brothers and sisters. The listeners keep this life in perspective by remembering the next one. The listeners keep this life in perspective by remembering the next one. Now, listen tonight. I want you to think about this. Could you imagine how much our lives would change if we quit treating tents like tabernacles? Do you imagine how much our life would change if we saw this as a temporary dwelling place? If we quit treating the temporal as though it was eternal? Now, someone reminded me of a point from a message a few years back. Now, I'd say that we as a nation are in a time of trial, and we go through trials collectively, and we go through trials individually, we know, and someone reminded me of something from a message, as I mentioned some time ago, and that is, listen, when in the midst of a time of trial, you have to remember the middle is not the end. The middle is not the end. It is going to come to an end, and the Lord says that here, only speaking on a global and eternal scale. Now, sometimes I think we often become guilty of a practice that we need to do away with, and that is to trivialize great truth into quaint Christian sayings. And I couldn't help but think of how much this happens at the funeral of a Christian. You know, we often say, and we say it very ethereally, they've gone to a better place. Right? Or they're better off now. Now, you know, I think those are nice platitudes of solace, but the fact is, friends, it's true. And what a fantastic thing to be able to say. Yeah, hey, they're in a better place. That's the understatement of all understatements. Yeah, they're in a better place. They're in heaven to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Heaven's a better place than the earth. Amen? Now think about this. Who else can say that after death, things get better? Just the listeners. Just those who heed and live according to the word of God. Now, I find it interesting some of the adages that people come up with. And I have to say, probably one of the most ridiculous statements I've ever heard, and it's been around ever since I can remember, is that some people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. That's nonsense. If we were more heavenly minded, we'd do more earthly good. If we focused on the things of heaven and knew we had an eternity that awaited us, reserved for us in heaven, we wouldn't get so bummed out about the things that come our way. And that's what the Lord is saying here. Hey, remember what's coming. There's an Eden-like situation coming back into your life, even though you are now in a time of captivity because of the disobedience as a nation collectively, but you stay faithful to my word individually. And when this is over, watch and see what I'm going to do to the city that was destroyed. Now, Peter gives some wise counsel in 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13, where he says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. What's his next instruction? Do not think it strange, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. How are you doing with that? Yeah, we don't always do so hot with that, do we? Now, how can we rejoice to the extent that we partake of Christ's sufferings? Well, it's quite simple. View where we are through the lens of where we're going. Remember, this world is not our home, amen, we say that. And that's a quaint statement that Christians like to make. 
But friends, there's nothing quaint about it. That's thunder. This world is not our home. This is going to end. Christ is going to come. We're going to come back with him because he's going to come and get us before he deals with a Christ-rejecting world. And our salvation will be forever. And his righteousness will not be abolished. And friends, all those things pertain to where we're going. And they're vitally important to where we are now. And friends, listen close, listeners. Lift up your eyes above the circumstances and put them on the city whose builder and maker is God. This is all going to pass away and vanish like smoke. The middle is not the end. Look up, look beyond the moment and rejoice. For 1 Thessalonians 5 says, God did not appoint us to wrath. I'll let that settle. I apparently didn't log in yet. God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we live or die, wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, listen to this instruction. Comfort each other and build one another up just as you also are doing. What's he using as the object to build one another up? What's coming? What our future is? God hasn't appointed us to wrath. There's a salvation that awaits us in all of its fullness and it will be experienced when we live together with him. Did not Jesus say in my father's house are many mansions? If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And when I come again, I may receive you unto myself. Do you believe that tonight? Yes. We need to perk up our ears to that. This world is not our home. And the only thing I can add to this section is this. Brothers and sisters, JLBF, asking WWJD, remembering he was in OTW. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Last two verses. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, you people in whose heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults. For the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. Now, I mentioned this chapter describes my life in ways I did not expect it to when I said verse 1 and 2 were kind of my launching pad, and I said yes to them, or my family did, I should say. Now, when the Lord awakened me in the middle of the night with the words Isaiah 51, and I read it through, as I mentioned, the following morning, I wasn't quite aware of how they would both change and also describe my life. Now, the decision to go to a land that the Lord would show us and bless us in was the promise was also followed by the insults of man, things that were unexpected, which only when you've made a decision, and I've shared with you before, the year after we left Harvest and moved down to Orange County once again, and uh, I hadn't taught a Bible study for a whole year, and it was exactly 365 days, and it was the most horrid, wretched year of my life, and it was continually plagued with what have I done? What have I done? That wasn't the Lord. No way. And here we are out there in no man's land and thank the Lord for a faithful wife who kept telling me, you got God, you got all you need. Amen. Amen. Now the word reproach means to cast scorn. And insults means just what you think it means, insults. And they came, friends, in droves when we left our home church. I was scorned and insulted in ways I never dreamed possible. Lies were told about me, and sadly, some believed them who should have known better because they knew me. Now, I also came under the attack of one who was once my closest friend, to the point of him calling Costa Mesa to try and stop our association with Calvary Chapel as a church. It was a horrid time, and all this was done with lies and insults. Now I have to say, verse seven just seemed like words for a while. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, do not fear the reproach of men. All I could think about was, well, men are getting away with this. 
And friends, listen, when you make a decision to be a listener and follow what the Lord is leading you to do, the devil is going to attack it. Now listen, here's the hard part. And he will use people as close to you as he can get because they can hurt you more than anybody else. And friends, listen. Those are the times where we need to remember that it's God who is called. What's the Lord's counsel? Amen. What's the Lord say here? When men are insulting you and throwing scorn and reproach at you, he says, forget about it. Isn't that what he's saying? Do not fear. Don't worry about these insults. And the Lord here is drawing the minds of the Jews even into the distant future as the allusions to judgment day are clear, but both the eternal and the temporal are in view. And he's talking about the being uh, eaten, the garment eaten by worms and moths and all that. And we have a rather graphic description of that in Acts 12, 20 to 24, when Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, they came with him to him with one accord, having made blastus to king's personal aid, their friend. They asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. So on a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a god and not of a man. They were in indicating that Herod was a god. Then immediately and an angel of the Lord struck him because he get, did not, what? Give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. But... The word of God grew and multiplied. Isn't that kind of a funny tag? <laughs> but there's the good news. The word of God grew and multiplied. That is good news indeed. Now listen. In an age where the listeners are few and the Herods are many, the Lord wants those who know righteousness and have the law of God written on their hearts to remember we are not to be afraid. We are not to live in fear in times such as these. When we who seek after righteousness and answer God's call on our lives and are met with the response of the adversary who seeks to take us out. Because the Lord says their future is the same as a moth-eaten garment or that of Herod here. Now, these verses were necessary in light of what the remnant of listeners were going to experience in the future after they went home from Babylon after their 70 years of captivity. Now, the Lord is telling them not to be afraid of the insults because he is going to return Jerusalem to an Eden-like status and it is going to blossom again. He'll turn the wasteland into something productive. Now, listen to what happened after the 70 years were up, after 42,000 Jews returned to the city to rebuild the walls. In Nehemiah 4, 1 through 6, we're told, but it so happened when Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and did what? Mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Insult. Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, rubbish stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, Whatever they build, even if a fox goes on it, it will break down their stone wall. Now Nehemiah chimes in. Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as a plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity. Do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people, what? Had a mind to work. I submit to you that they were listeners, that they were heeding the word of God. Look at the insults that are hurled at those who answer the call of God to complete a humanly impossible task. Look at the things they're saying them. They called them, saying about them. They called them feeble. You know what the worst part about that insult was? It was true. They were feeble. They were a bunch of old men and families, and they were not stonemasons who were seeking to reassemble these walls built out of huge limestone blocks. And they even then begin to insult their building materials. Say, what are they going to build with? Stones burned with fire? Well, the fact is, limestone, which they were building with, when it's superheated and the walls were indeed burned down, loses its structural integrity and it's not good for construction anymore. 
Yet with God, all things are possible. Amen? And that's what the devil does with us. He comes in and starts saying, God can't build anything with you. You're so burned up. You're so burned out. You're of no use to him. But you, friend, are God's choice building material. You're the one that he wants to use. He selects us, even though we've gone through difficulty. They question the quality of their workmanship. Again, the crowd growing. Tobiah now chiming in. If a light-footed fox steps on the wall, that thing's coming down. Can you hear them all laughing with him? (laughs) Yeah, that's right, a fox. Nehemiah said, Lord, handle this, would you? And he did. Now, they built the wall because the Lord said through Isaiah, remember what you're made of. Remember my past performance. Don't let insults drive you to fear. So the people listened and they set their mind to the work and it was completed in 52 days. Now, here's our last point tonight. The listeners do not abandon their calling due to trials or adversity. The listeners do not abandon their calling due to trials or adversity. Now, some of you probably remember that we learned something as we studied through the book of Nehemiah. Anybody remember it? We call it, and still do, our manifesto. Do you remember how it goes? Anybody remember how it goes? Raise your hand if you remember. A couple of you, a handful of you. Well, it goes like this. We learned this as we studied the 13 chapters of Nehemiah, and I think it's well to be repeated tonight. Brother and sisters, here's some good, strong self-talk. I am a child of God, destined to make a difference. I will not doubt or fear in the face of adversity. I am committed to God's will for my life, no matter what opposition may come. I will praise God for every blessing and through every trial, for he will never fail me. I will put God first every day of my life that I may hear him say, well done. That's the life of the listener. That's the life we have been called to. Now, as we move out further in Isaiah 51, we'll find in verses 22 to 23, thus says, I like this, your Lord. Again, he's speaking to the remnant. The Lord and your God, who pleads the cause of his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup of trembling. The dregs of the cup of my fury, you shall no longer drink it, but I will put it into the hand of those who afflict you, who have said to you, lie down that we may walk over you. And you have laid your body like the ground and as a street for those who walk over. Now, the Lord says to the listeners, you did what was right when times were tough. You did what was right in Babylon. As hard as it was, even though it was your own nation's fault that you were in captivity, you did not abandon your call. And those who used to make you bow your faces in the dirt, and afflicted you as they walked by, the Lord says, their time's coming. Their turn is coming. Now, the word trembling means astonishment. Now, have you ever been astonished at the actions of your enemies? It's amazing the things that people will say and do. But even in the midst of that, even in the midst of our astonishment, we have to stay faithful in the face of adversity. Now, friends, listen. Let me just give you one last little word here tonight. Proverbs 24, 17, and 18 says, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. Now, I share that, and I think it's timely for this reason. One of the devil's favorite tactics is to get us more focused on the opposition than our calling. One of his favorite tactics is to get us to focus more on the opposition than our calling. Listeners are wise to that. And we don't let him do that. You see how easy it could have been to be consumed for hatred for the Babylonians by the captive Jews. But here's the deal, friends. I want you to consider something tonight in conclusion. When we allow adversity or compromise to blow us off course, the Lord then has to work on us instead of through us. And he has to get us back into a usable condition. Now, he's always working on us, right? None of us are perfect. Amen? 
None of us are perfect, and we will be when we see Jesus. We'll be like him. But the application is circumstance-oriented here, and the circumstances were, it looked like the enemy won. It looked like the enemy won. And it was a great chance to spiral downward, emotionally, certainly spiritually. So friends, listen, let's stay the course. Amen? Amen. Let's stay the course. Listen, the Supreme Court findings today, or their opinions rather, were no surprise. And neither are the attacks on the listeners. But the fact is today, brothers and sisters, church people are jumping ship in numbers, in droves, I should say. And they are, listen, getting on the bandwagon where the seating is more comfortable. Not the listeners. And friends, listen, God always has a remnant. Who are they? The listeners. The ones who believe and live according to the word of God. And they do this while viewing this life through the lens of the next one knowing that good things are on the way. And when the enemy insults and reproaches come at them continually, God says, don't worry about it. I'll handle them. And he does. And he says to you, he says to me, just keep listening to me. Him. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for this awesome chapter. Lord, I thank you for the personal meaning it has to me. God, thank you for proving again for so many of us time and again all over your word that it is living and powerful. It speaks to us right where we're at in times such as these. And Lord, I pray that we would be truth speakers today, but we would do so in love. And God, that we would not be afraid of that which we see stirring in our land. For you haven't given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And Lord, even as we learn through our awesome journey through the book of Nehemiah, that we're committed to your will no matter what opposition may come. And help us to continue in that, God. Help that not to be just a phrase and something we repeat that warms our hearts and reminds us of truth. But help it to be a living reality, God, something practiced daily. Because we live in a day of great opposition. And it's growing just like it did when Nehemiah and company were rebuilding the wall. The crowd grew, the taunts increased, but the work got done because the people set their mind to it. May we set our minds to your good work. May we be listeners and hear your voice and follow, no matter what the enemy throws at us. Thank you, God, that heaven awaits us. How we look forward to seeing you face to face. But Lord, we consider this night as well. Many are perishing without you. Strengthen us to the task, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God does not lose. Listen, he doesn't even have any close calls. (laughs) No problem is too great for him. They're all the same size, right? You know, I'm glad. I think we need to have some good pictures in our mind, even though we don't know what the Lord looks like, but I think we need to do away with maybe a thought that he frets over some situations, like, what am I going to do with this? It doesn't happen. Whether it's a nation or an individual, God can handle it like that. And he's told us the whole story, and I'm thankful for that. So friends, listen, don't be in despair, even as our hearts are sorrowful. Remember, Nehemiah, when he heard the report of those who had gone and looked at the city and it came back to him that the gates were burned with fire, the wall had been disassembled, all these other things that Nehemiah heard. He went before as a cupbearer to the king and stood before Artaxerxes. And by the way, if you went before the king and you made in Babylonian culture, you made uh, the king sad, or Persian culture, I should say, you made the king sad, you were executed. And Nehemiah went with his countenance changed, and the king even said, what is this? This is nothing other than sorrow of heart. And Nehemiah said, why shouldn't I be sad? The city of my father's is in ruins. It has been destroyed. And the king, the pagan king, said, what do you need? 
You see, God was in control all along. And listen, it's okay for us to be bummed about what happened today. We should be. It's kind of disgusting. Amen? Amen. But friends, that doesn't own us. It doesn't rule us. Keep building. Amen? Keep telling people about Jesus. I'll see you Sunday. You need are you listening? I'll tell you the truth about God. My eyes haven't seen him, and these hands never touched him. I've never seen the wind, but I felt the breeze.